Welcome to the Owner Insight Podcast. Mark Schwartz behind the mic today, and I'm so excited to be joined by Mark Gravely. Uh, Mark is an award-winning construction lawyer and one of an elite group of U.S. infrastructure attorneys. Uh, he founded and leads a Dallas-based national law firm, Gravely Attorneys and Counselors, and they primarily focus on serious construction litigation on behalf of both private and public property owners. Uh, he has multiple nine-figure cases to his credit. He's also a sought-after speaker on construction and infrastructure topics, including a recent presentation uh, to the Mensa World Gathering, and he frequently provides commentary and context for legal, business, and mainstream media outlets. Uh, and if that's not enough, he's also a prolific author. His most recent book just came out. It's called Reframing America's Infrastructure, A Ruins to Renaissance Playbook. And uh, despite being out uh, only, uh, I think, a few weeks, it's already a, an Amazon bestseller. So congratulations, and Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Thanks for being Mark. here with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So no, we're thrilled. Uh, you are a busy guy, so thank you for making some time in your day to, uh, to chat with us. Uh, we're excited about it, and we're going to dive right in. Uh, you know, our CEO, Steve Harper, is a huge comic book fan as anybody who I think uh, watches or listens to the podcast probably knows. Uh, and so he has a, a, a habit of asking people that he meets, what is their origin story? So I wanna start out the same way. I wanna ask you about your origin story. How is it that you got into the field of construction law? Well, you know, I didn't grow up. I mean, you know, when I was, when I was 13 or 14, I wanted to be an Air Force pilot or a Navy pilot. And, uh, uh, that didn't end up working out, so I ended up going to law school, uh, kind of as a backup. Uh, I had started in medical school, uh, and I found out I didn't like that either, so I went to law school. And I really kind of fell into it. My first job right out of law school was uh, representing architects and engineers and design professionals uh, in construction issues uh, and some injury cases. And so that's how I got interested in the, the world of construction and insurance. Uh, and then after that, I went to work for a, a law firm in Texas here that only represented general contractors. And so uh, I did that for uh, a few years. And that really made me interested in the whole uh, world of construction, construction litigation, um, you know, learning how the conflicts arise on a big construction project, uh, learning the way to find the client some money to resolve things, because at the end of it all, money resolves things. Typically, that's true. That's the only thing I can get for a client is money, uh, typically. So uh, I guess that's my origin story. So how did you end up uh, flipping from representing contractors to owners? Well, uh, that's a good question. I, I saw an opening, you know, most law firms uh, who do construction really want to target general contractors. Right. Because they build, you know, you know many big projects. Uh, there, it seems like there's always a headache. There's always a problem, whether it's a lien, a construction issue, uh, and contracting in such a high profit margin area, they can afford to pay uh, the very biggest and best law firms. And so the law firms really chase uh, the general contractors I found. So I thought uh, that it would be fun to have a law firm that only represented owners against general, general contractors and architects and design professionals. And so uh, for the past 15 years or so, that's what we've done exclusively is represent owners only uh, against uh, developers, general contractors, and design professionals. And I found out there's a huge market for it because we're really, really busy. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. You know, our, our software is, is the same thing geared for owners instead of contractors, and, and we've definitely seen that need. Um, there's a lot of resources out there for contractors, and and I think you hit your uh, you know the, the nail on the head as to why. But owners have kind of gotten the, the short shrift sometimes with that. Um, I, I noticed that you, you know you work with a, a wide range of both public and private owners, uh, school districts, higher education, healthcare organizations, municipal and county governments, uh, retirement communities, homeowner uh, associations. You know, there's a that's not even the full list. Now, um, don't forget hospitals, too. We, hospitals, uh, you know, right. We, we, right. So, uh, I've represented a lot of hospitals. So what makes an owner a good fit for your services? 
Well, you know, typically nobody calls me unless something's gone wrong. And, uh, you know, we're the law firm that comes in, you know, we don't come in to write a letter to try to resolve something. We are called on when there's uh, major issues and there's no movement from the other side to comply with the agreement that they've made to build the project in a, in a good and workmanlike manner or to meet all the relevant codes. And at some point, there becomes an impasse between uh, the, the people that designed and built the project and the owner. Uh, and so I'm usually called in before that or uh, at that time uh, to give the owner their options to recover cost to repair for design or construction defects. And so that's typically how we get involved uh, uh, on, a, on a project, whether it's a, a county jail, uh, you know, a big hospital, a municipal hospital, for example, uh, you know, uh, an HOA is having problems with their balconies or windows. Uh, and things just aren't working like they should. So that's typically how I get involved. Okay. Uh, you know, from a, a legal perspective, uh, since you you sort of come in after things have taken a wrong turn from an owner's standpoint, uh, what have you seen in terms of some misconceptions or wrong assumptions maybe that owners have about the construction process? Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest misconception is is that the warranties are gonna be honored by the general contractor. Uh, and that on a project that's big enough, there's always going to be problems. And the best time to take care of a problem is before it happens. And so, you know, if there was a method by which owners could have a systematic uh, process to keep an eye on things during construction. Uh, if, if only there was some software that did that. <laughs> you know, uh, that would be a huge benefit to owners as they went. Now, the fact is, is that even when there's such a wonderful process in place, uh, people are human and problems are still gonna happen. It's just a fact. Uh, I haven't seen a, a large construction project yet that gets done uh, right on time when the owner expected it to be done because you know, construction is an art and it's a science. Uh, and so um, uh, the biggest misconceptions I see that owners have is that everything's gonna be all right and the, the warranties are gonna be honored. And here's why that doesn't happen. It's because the design professionals, the architects perhaps, or maybe it's a subconsultant, uh, an engineer, mechanical or a civil engineer, or the general contractor, they can't afford to fix the problem. They can only afford to uh, kind of placate the owner to kind of uh, put a Band-Aid on the problems that have already happened. Because when something's already built, it's done. The die is, so to speak, cast. And to go back to really do it right, there's just no money there from the general contractor or architect. And so one of the things we try to show to our owner clients is that there is a path forward, and that's with the liability insurance that's available. Uh, and the only time you can really uh, get that into play is, I'm sorry to say, by filing a lawsuit. And that happens after closeout? When, when a, it a is, contractor you know, uh, has, has failed to address a potential defect? Right. That, the lawsuit typically happens after the owner has given repeated chances to the uh, uh, architect, uh, or the general contractor or other design professionals to remedy the problems. Um, you know, uh, everybody should be given a chance, I've always felt, to fix, uh, you know, in the context of the, of the agreement, uh, to make something right. Uh, and that's just good business. But the reason that it can be made right so often is because the parties responsible really just can't afford to do it because they're, they want to move on to the next project. Right. You know, they want, they want to close this project out. They want to finish this project. They, they want their accounting books, you know, for the coming year to be clear of any problems. And, uh, you know, that's what we typically see. Yeah, I was just seeing some statistics uh, that came out, uh, you know, looking at especially the effect that we've had with these sort of COVID caused disruptions to supply chains and the labor pool and inflationary pressures. And almost three quarters of contractors now are saying that projects are taking longer than anticipated. Well, and they are. Uh, go back to that of 
when that's the case, you know, there's a lot of pressure. And, and then there was a majority saying they're having trouble moving off of these projects to the next ones that are scheduled. So thinking about it from that contractor perspective, absolutely. I think, you know, you're right They're They're trying to get this thing nailed down so that they can move on to the next thing. And it's the owner, of, obviously, who has to deal with the consequences if there's defective work or shortcuts that have been taken. Right. And, you know, part of what you're talking about is uh, is the delays in finishing are addressed by the contract typically for construction, and they're known as delay damages. Uh, there are spe uh, specific provisions in contracts that have to do with liquidated damages. Uh, and what happens is, is that the two parties don't ever really want to be responsible for what is known in the legal profession as consequential damages, because those can be really, really big. And so neither the contractor nor the owner typically want to be responsible for those. And so they exclude those in their agreement from each other. And so there's a pre-planned set of delay damages that are usually addressed uh, and quantified in the contract for the project by the owner, I am the contractor, and each tries to hedge their risk for delays. Uh, and they try to uh, kind of pre-assess or predict worst case scenario. Um, uh, the good news for owners and contractors is, is that uh, contractors have a pretty predictable overhead. They have a pretty predictable workflow. Uh, most of them are pretty well organized. And so when they hedge their risk in the, uh, uh, we'll call it the liquidated damages clause or the delay damages clause, contractors are pretty good about estimating on delays. For example, contracts allow for rain days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to rain during a project. Uh, and that's a fact. Um, you know, I guess we can add that to the two certain things in the world, debt taxes and rain delays on projects. Yeah. And, you know, so, uh, but that's already built in. And the owner, you know, reasonably expects some delays to happen. But all that's typically addressed in a contract provision that the parties agree to. Um, and you can't always guess uh, exactly right about how long it's going to be. But the second big cause of delays on projects are uh, worker shortages or shortages of people who, who put their hands on the project, who build out things. You know, a lot of general contractors uh, hire subcontractors and when they manage the work, uh, they don't do most of the work themselves. They don't self-perform. And so uh, it's up to the subcontractors, uh, you know, in a way the general contractor kind of divides and conquers. There's the electrical subcontractor. There's the uh, plumbing subcontractor. There's the you know, uh, perhaps framing subcontractor, the concrete subcontractor. And it's up to each subcontractor to hire and manage the people who do the work that they've agreed to do. And so there's a, a known shortage. Uh, I think you can go to the AGC website, uh, Construction Dive 2, and they talk about um, shortages of people uh, and shortages of, of folks to actually build things. So that's another cause of delays on a project. Uh, that, you know, a general contractor and subcontractors should certainly be able to plan for, at least in some respect. Right. Well, and, you know, related issue to that, because I was just looking at those numbers, actually, and uh, the Commercial Construction Index, which gets published quarterly, uh, looked at, uh, you know, the contractor surveyed, 62% uh, of them say that they're having high difficulty finding skilled workers. And that's up from 55% in the last quarter. So obviously, you know, that's a, a problem that's escalating, not declining. Uh, and then an additional 56% of contractors surveyed said that they had a, quote, high degree of concern about their workers having adequate skill levels. So, you know, that led me to, to think, okay, you're having trouble getting people. You're sort of getting some warm bodies sometimes to fill out the crew. What does that potentially mean for construction project owners going forward? Well, you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of trust that an owner gives to a general contractor um, and the design folks when they sign on to do a, you know, a, a couple hundred million dollar project. And, you know, there are things that, that are acceptable in the business community with regards to delays. But one thing, the main thing for an owner is when you, uh, for example, have multiple bids, Maybe you get to know the people you're going to hire. There is a huge, huge aspect of personal trust. And so the fact is, is that 
uh, you know, uh, we live in America. Uh, we live in a, a mostly capitalist society. You know, we want the general contractors to be able to make, you know, uh, a bunch of money doing what they're doing, you know, competitive rates, certainly. But ultimately, it all falls on the shoulders of the general contractor uh, and the design professionals where appropriate to properly staff everything. You know, the Texas economy has really been pretty hot for the past decade. There's been a bit of a recession, uh, not as bad uh, as they saw on both coasts of the United States. But the economy has just been red hot. And with all this infrastructure money coming from the federal government, it's going to get even hotter. And so those statistics you cited just a few minutes ago, you know, those are going to be uh, exacerbated or, or even more pronounced because of all the construction money coming down the pike, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I personally don't think there's enough people to build everything that's gonna be happening. Uh, but, you know, general contractors are amazing entrepreneurs uh, and design professionals are, can be amazingly resilient. Uh, I'm excited to see what's gonna happen down the road, but, um, you know, some predict uh, if we do find enough folks, uh, even more of a kind of a construction renaissance than we've ever seen in the US. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like there's an opportunity here for, you know, some exciting innovations in how projects are designed and how they're, they're managed. Um, but I think in the short term, there's got to be some concern on the part of owners, right, that you've got people who are working on your project who may not be the most qualified. And, you know, that is going to potentially lead to some defects down the road. Um, it could, so but you know, General contractors and, and design folks are really the ones that have a better understanding of that, that have a finger on the pulse of the problems uh, in getting qualified people to, uh, to work on these projects. You know, most owners don't build that many projects. Uh, for example, larger projects. Most owners build, uh, you know, one project at a time, sometimes if it's private. Um, for municipal projects, sometimes they'll be used to... Uh, building a lot of projects, spending a lot of federal or state money. But, you know, what I hear from the owners is not so much questions about will the general contractor have enough people qualified. They're really just concerned about the terms of the agreement. And that's where their responsibility, frankly, ends. And the, and the shift and the burden shifts onto the general contractor to perform all the promises that it's made in their agreement. So when I talk to owners groups, uh, you know, when I, uh, for example, uh, give a talk at the Texas Hospital Association uh, or the Texas uh, uh, Hotel and Lodging Association, the questions that I get are not, are there enough skilled workers? The question is, what are the three or four contract provisions I need to be sure that I'm on top of to protect our rights and to, you know, preserve our right to recover cost of repair in the event, in the un unfortunate event that we need to pursue that. So, you know, unskilled labor is really, or labor shortages really don't come up much with owners. So what are the issues that, uh, in your experience, most commonly lead to litigation? Well, at the end of a project closeout, there's the punch list, which by and large uh, are the, the smaller things, doorknobs, uh, paint, touch-ups, uh, you know, maybe a, a corner was cut here or there. Um, you know, cosmetic issues are really on the punch out list. The biggest things that we see that become issues have to do with systems. For example, uh, the uh, uh, mechanical system, the HVAC system, uh, doesn't get tested and balanced like it should be, or doesn't get commissioned like it should be, and uh, really kind of falls victim to an end of project, project fatigue. We want to be finished with this project. Let's just get it done. We have to move in. You know, our lender is saying this and that. We just need to be in. So one of the big things we see is a lack of true detail work and finish out with the HVEC system, which, Mark, is the most important system in the building because it dictates what the built environment is going to be like for the rest of the life of the building. Right. Um, the second thing we see uh, pretty often with regard to the HVEC system is a lack of training for the uh, maintenance folks, existing maintenance folks with the owner to really address problems um, such that they end up having to hire and spend more money to hire a third party mechanical engineering outfit 
to come and teach them or to address uh, issues here and there. So uh, at the end of the warranty period, when the owner doesn't have any more credit, so to speak, to get someone from the GC or uh, maybe the, the architectural uh, outfit to come out, uh, that's the biggest thing we see. Uh, other systems that we see issues with are the window system and the envelope system. You know, after the HVAC system, which regulates the built environment, the entire indoor environment, the, uh, the envelope system, the system of the walls and the windows in the building that allow the HVAC system to function properly. Uh, we see uh, moisture penetration, we see breaches in the system. Um, every now and then we'll see flashing issues uh, in the entire project where the flashing just wasn't installed. And you know that's the reason your uh, uh, electric bills are so high for owners is because the envelope has been compromised and the system is working so hard to keep up, you're spending twice or three times what you should to heat and cool your building. This is especially important in healthcare facilities with uh, folks that are immunocompromised or where temperature and the regulation of the temperature are especially important for the building occupants. Mm -hmm. Another system that we see all the time that there's problems with uh, is the, the window system, which is, uh, can be a part of the building envelope, but window systems that are leaky or that allow for uh, air exfiltration or infiltration uh, can be a problem. Uh, grading and drainage systems, depending on what the footprint of the building is, the grading and drainage systems uh, may not have been designed properly or maybe weren't graded and drained properly. Right there is another example of the project fatigue, I call it, or project closeout. You know, the GC wants to be finished. Uh, the grading and drainage is not really something anybody looks at too much unless there's a problem. And so uh, consequently, uh, the, the, maybe the, the grading is not done as the civil engineer has designed it. And what you end up with is moisture against the building, which compromises the foundation or the envelope and it almost always leads to problems uh, over time. But the last system we see, there's been a bunch of systems, hasn't there? The last <laughs> system we see uh, problems with typically is the roof system. You know, there's so many roofing products these days that the roof is an engineered system unto itself. And if it's not affixed properly, uh, for example, for the wind code, uh, or if it's not uh, installed properly, uh, it's going to leak. And it uh, itself can be a part of the problem with the envelope system. Um, you know, I always think about growing up. Uh, I don't know if you remember what your life was like when you were 13. But when I went out the front door to play and I left the door open and it was winter or summer, my, my mom would always yell, or my dad, we're not air conditioning the street. Right. Or we're not heating the street. I don't know if that happened to you. Yes, all well, the time. Yeah, so I think, I think everybody can re remember something like that. Uh, and so that's what essentially is happening when there's a problem with any of these systems, except for perhaps grading and drainage, is that you're air conditioning the street uh, and if your mom or dad were around, they'd be yelling at you, hey, we're not air conditioning the street. We're not cooling the street. Um, so those are some things that we see can go wrong from time to time. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So I come from, uh, you know, background in public education and uh, thinking about just utility costs, particularly here in Texas for uh, school buildings. I mean, it is uh, just this districts are always looking for ways to capture savings in that area because it is uh, just such a, a large part of the facility's budget. Uh, it is. And, you know, it'll creep up on you, too. Uh, for example, if you're uh, let's say you're a new superintendent at a school district and, you know, you have a budget to work with. And there are some things that you just, you know, you get the bill and you have to pay it. Uh, you know, teacher salaries, of course, you know, those are relatively fixed. Um, uh, you know, uh, capital projects, sometimes you have new bond for that. But the one area that I see that uh, superintendents can really focus on is how to reduce their electric cost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, besides the fact that commercial buildings, including school buildings, are the number one source for greenhouse gases. Besides that fact, the electricity that it takes to heat and cool uh, school buildings, which are not small buildings, they're usually large buildings, 
the electricity costs will creep up and uh, it can become a larger and larger problem over time. And, you know, unless you get uh, unless you get those repaired or get the costs from the people responsible for those increased costs, uh, you're just printing money and shipping it right out the front door right. uh, to your electric company. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of superintendents and uh, CFOs or uh, directors of the business offices of school districts uh, who would do well to find a way uh, to get money from those responsible to fix their envelope, to reduce their costs. Yeah. Um, over time, they can really add up. Well, and I think for, for school districts in particular, because uh, most projects, particularly capital construction projects, are bond funded, you know, it's a completely different bucket of money. And I think it's really easy to sort of segregate the, the cost of it into that and not think about the fact that you still have all of these carrying costs going forward that come out of a different budget. And that's the same budget, ultimately, that you use for teacher salaries. So when you start to, to see these inefficiencies, and they start to cascade on you, I mean, those savings have to come out of, uh, you know, or that, that, that unexpected expenditure has to come out of somewhere. And, you know, at the end of the day, the largest uh, expenditure for any school district is its salaries. And that and the largest pool of salaries is going to be your teacher salaries. So inevitably, when we start talking about teacher cuts, it's because something else has has happened that has something you know, else has gone up. Right. It's, it's a zero sum, you know. <clears throat> and so, it, I mean, it's and I've, I've seen figures, you know, in a couple of districts when they look at here's how much we're spending on utility costs. And, you know, if we could get it down to this level, we could recapture one or two teacher positions potentially. Uh, right. And, you know, that's the job. That's the job of the school district, right, is, is or educators is to educate. You know, it's it's not to deal with all, all these problems, uh, you know, within a building. Right. Uh, although they, they do have to deal with it. You well, know, and that's that's one of the challenges. I, I was going to say it's one of the challenges though, that we encounter is that because their job is to educate, their experience is all centered around education. So even though in particularly larger districts, you have facilities professionals and, and maintenance professionals uh, who are used to interacting with this group, your top district decision makers, your, your you know, district superintendent, assistant superintendents, your CFOs, I mean, these are not people who live in that construction space in mm -hmm. the way that you were describing like general contractors do. Uh, and so what, what can they do during the process to try to you know, correct these things before they happen? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, as you were saying, some of these things are not immediately evident. Uh, you know, it takes time for, for you to sort of see these efficiencies stack up. Uh, and it's always going to be more expensive to do something after the fact than if you can try to nip it in the bud. So what, what do they need? What kind of visibility do they need throughout the project? Or what kind of, of actions can they take to try to ensure that you know, the work is being done right, despite the pressures to finish on time? And, I, and you know, hey, I, I feel you on that because there is no greater pressure than trying to get a school finished in time for that first day of classes. That right. is a PR disaster if you don't have those uh, doors open and you know parents aren't dropping their kids off. Well, you know, one thing, uh, one there's a couple of things I've seen school districts do. I've seen a couple of approaches, and you know, the answer is not uh, typically to hire someone else to keep an eye on the design team and the uh, general contractor. You know, the promises they've made uh, and the agreements they've made are are you know they're enforceable, right? It's a contract. But the thing that I see most often uh, that has resulted in a much lower rate uh, of defects uh, is a system during construction that the general contractor has to follow that is set out by the school district. That uh, there is constant communication, there are uh, boxes that are checked, there are milestones that are met. And that if the school district has a system, uh, for example, a software system, that they can use, uh, it educates them at the same time during the project at a much lower cost than a, than a project manager, for example, um, uh, who can be good guide, uh, if you know what I mean, into looking over some stuff. But with, uh, with a rigorous uh, and stepwise process, the answer is gonna be yes or no. Is the milestone been met? You know, uh, are these quality points? Have you checked on these quality points? And I think that can be a wonderful addition, uh, in addition to 
uh, the contract, the promises that are made by the general contractor and the design professionals. I think that uh, the districts that I've seen that employ that method have far fewer post-construction problems. And I would imagine then you, you have the data and the documentation so that even if there are issues post-construction, it becomes easier for someone like you to come in and get redress for that much more quickly and efficiently because you that's right much much easier to prove the case yeah uh you know the fact is is that when when you know a lot of people don't like to talk about problems uh sometimes it's husbands and wives sometimes it's uh co-workers you know sometimes it's family members but the fact is is that building a project is a commercial transaction and you have to talk about the problems and you have to meet them head on because at the end of the day, the school district has to live with them. The people that built the project don't have to live with them. Mm -hmm. And so the insistence on communication of all the stakeholders, of all the involved parties should be something that is absolutely demanded by the school district. And you know, regular meetings, good communication and difficult questions are gonna have to be asked. There's gonna be uncomfortable conversations because that's the nature of construction. But at the end of the day, you know, no honest contractor is going to mind being held to account by, for the promises they made. Um, you know, the profit margins are huge, absolutely astronomical. And that's great. We're happy people make a great living and can, you know, build hundred million dollar empires from uh, building things. That's wonderful. But no honest contractor uh, looks the other way or will run from a difficult conversation about a problem. Um, that's what I found. Yeah, and that's reassuring, I think, for uh, project owners to not be afraid to broach those subjects. Um, yeah, people, you know, people just don't like conflict and it's a yeah. natural human thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, nobody really likes conflict, but when you when you are the steward of those amounts of money and, you know, when you're a, a board member, for example, for a school district, uh, uh, or a super, you have a fiduciary duty or a really high duty to the public to, to you know, follow where the, the facts lead, follow that line of breadcrumbs. Here's the problem. What are you guys going to do to fix this? Right. Uh, you know, too often I see a, a, an owner or perhaps even a school district get talked into less than they bargained for because they want to shy away from the conflict. Right. Yeah. And again, I, I think, you know, my, my two cents is that that's a, a function in some of these cases of their background. They don't feel as equipped to be able to ask those questions or to have those tough conversations. And so if they don't have a proxy to do it, uh, sometimes it's just easier to, to sort of accept that, well, the other party's acting on good faith and it's all right. going to work out right. in the end. And sometimes it does, but I've, I've seen cases where it doesn't. And you know, in today's environment, too, where voters, at least in this last election cycle, uh, seemed a lot more skeptical about school bonds than before. And even in fast growing districts, we're not as inclined to approve uh, bonds for new construction or for renovation. You know, it seems to me that district leaders in particular had better be on their game because they've got to be able to show voters that we executed on the current bond uh, as efficiently as possible. We got full value for your tax money. Before that's right. Make ask you for hundreds of millions of dollars more. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, like like we've all heard growing up, if you'll just do the work, if everybody will just do what they're supposed to do, uh, you know, whether it's in the construction contract, whether it's calling somebody out after the fact, um, you know, you'll you'll always end up on the side of right if you do what you're supposed to do, whether that's a school board, a superintendent, general contractor, uh, or you know, design uh, design professional. Right. Well, so let's pivot to, you know, they've done everything during the process that, that reasonably they, they felt like they could do. We get to uh, close out and we've got a, a punch list items that, that, that you know, look like they're uh, fairly uh, mundane. And then after close out, we start to see some issues. Uh, what are the options for owners at that point? Uh, you know, what is it that that several months and particularly, you know, there's that window where the, the contractor is still under warranty. Uh, what should mm -hmm. they be doing to maximize their investment during that period? Well, there's two, there's really two things that they need to make sure they do when they notice a problem, send an email. 
It's very easy. You send an email uh, or maybe you wait till the end of a month and you send an email about all the issues that you've observed uh, and ask uh, when you can expect them to come out. You should always give a deadline. Um, you know, when will you guys be here in the next 30 days? You know, do you need an engineer to come look? Uh, you know, why do you think this problem? Asking questions is always a good idea because remember, these contractors and design folks, they occupy a place of trust because they're the experts. And so, you know, somebody who, who is an educator shouldn't have to guess at what's wrong. They, sh they need to report what they see and there should be a reasonable explanation given. And the next thing that happens is the people responsible need to investigate the problem. And the school district or the owner should ask, what, what are the results of your investigation? They should ask, you know, who they sent, when, they, when they're going to send them, and what the findings were. Because ultimately, everybody's got a boss. That's going to be have to report it by the owner back up to who, whoever, you know, what their boss is. Maybe it's the board of directors. Uh, you know, maybe it's the CFO. Excuse me. And so uh, send an email. That's the easiest thing to do. And then set a deadline. You know, we've got one case right now we're handling um, for uh, a school district where emails were repeatedly sent and there was no legitimate reply ever received. And uh, I think there was one even one email that said, well, look, you're just going to have to live with it. We're done here. And, you know, well, that's just not a reasonable nor an acceptable you know, reply from a businessman to a public servant who has just spent 60 million dollars on a new building. And so. Uh, so in the vein of what I mentioned before, you point out the issues, you've given them a chance. Now what you have are exhibits for the deposition that that person's gonna have to uh, sit for under oath to talk about why did you brush these people off? Why did you not honestly give us a response on something we paid you $60 million to do? And so the emails serve a couple purposes. One is uh, you know, to put the responsible parties on notice of what the issues are. Uh, and number two, it gives them a chance to respond. You know, maybe the subcontractor uh, responsible went out of business. Well, that's not the owner's fault. The general contractor still has to respond because they're the ones that made the promises. Um, here's another one we hear. Well, that's the architect's issue. Yeah, that's not a general contractor issue. And and the parties, you know, they're they pull at each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you get them both on the email thread. And you say, hey, you're both saying it's each other's fault. I know it's not our fault because all we did was write you checks for $60 million. You guys are going to have to work it out. Uh, let me know what you're going to do by the end of the month, please. And you've given a chance. You've given them a chance. But, you know, uh, kind of looping back to what I mentioned before, uh, you know why they typically don't respond in a constructive fashion? It's because they can't afford to fix what's wrong. Only when their insurance companies get triggered will there be money for the owner for true cost to repair. Uh, that's what we've seen most often. Wow. Okay. Uh, and and that trigger is ultimately litigation, right? It's a lawsuit. Yes, it's a lawsuit. And um, and you know, if you're an owner, if you think about it, when you pay, let's say, sixty million dollars for a project, part of the money goes to the liability insurance for the people that built it. So when you file a lawsuit, that's a mechanism to collect the benefits that you've already paid for anyway, that the taxpayers have paid for. And it's all right there, uh, you know, for you to prove up uh, through expert reports, you know, through your uh, expert counsel. And that's the pathway to, for money on cost of repair is getting the insurance carrier involved, which is really benefits that, that uh, the owner or the school district has already paid for. So I know one of the, the services that you provide owners is what you call a construction quality audit. Uh, and this is something that happens, again, sort of post-close out once some of these issues are being identified. Uh, so I, I, can you tell me just a little bit about sort of what it is, its, its purpose, and what it entails? I will. You know, there's an ebook on our law firm website at gravely.law uh, for, for free to download, uh, and it's entitled Post-Construction Quality Audit. Uh, and it lays it all out in exquisite detail. But fundamentally is uh, the post-construction quality audit is the process by which the owner 
can get an honest reckoning by an independent expert as to what the issues are and who's responsible. And it's, it's, it's a prelude to the owner uh, understanding through an independent evaluation at no cost what's really going on with their building. Uh, the rest of it really happens through discussions with the owner about what their goals are, uh, about whether or not they want to, uh, you know, tap on that insurance money that's available to them for cost of repair. But the audit, the construction quality audit will review uh, um, the different systems of the project, the roof system that we talked about earlier, the envelope system, the HVAC system, uh, the grading and drainage system. And it will examine those systems to put the owner in the best position possible to have the information they need to make the best decisions on whether or not to proceed with recovering cost of repair. That's really what it's all about. So uh, do you see a, sort of a, a difference in the success rates uh, for those owners who have a post-construction quality audit, audit done versus those who don't in terms of, of sort of the, um, you know, the, the uh, remuneration that they get from contractors or? or I, I do. You know, I, I have had clients who uh, have, have decided not to get the audit and, and down the road, uh, you know, they're still having the same problems because, you know, construction problems or problems with the project don't get better. They only get worse. Right. And water is the enemy of a constructed building in the built environment. And so as the years roll by, the uh, the issues that they had that they thought they could live with, um, that they wanted to avoid conflict with, really, they just get worse. And so uh, maintenance costs can go up. Uh, you know, Electric costs can go up. Uh, carbon footprint gets bigger uh, because of leaks in the uh, in the system. Uh, uh, a lot of the ones I've seen that have conducted the construction quality audit uh, are able to make better decisions as to what to do uh, and who to recover from to fix things. You know, boards of directors really appreciate the audit uh, and have found that it's uh, it's a great tool that a project owner has. Uh, to do their best to fulfill their duties to recover money for cost of repair to keep to try to keep costs down over time. Yeah, it sounds like it's just uh, such a, a sort of a common sense kind of approach to this. Um, you know, given the the level of investment that any owner is making in a project, and uh, you know, I'm just thinking about the, uh, uh, the the times where, particularly with like school buildings, there were things that were noted, and even if those were addressed. There were other things later that showed up, you know, maybe a couple of years down the road that everybody felt was probably connected to that original issue, right. but, you know, but nobody knew about it at the time. And so I'm just wondering, yeah, you know, if there had been something like this, where we had gone in and had a more comprehensive view and said, you know, if we're seeing this over here, maybe we need to be looking at these other systems as well, <clears throat> just to make sure, um, you know, that might have been uh, a way to save uh, a lot of time and money for uh, everybody concerned, frankly. Yeah, that's 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 a great observation. You know, we generally see if there's a major problem with one system, uh, I'd say over 90 percent of the time, the quality construction audit finds a problem with another system that the owner didn't think was that big of a deal. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, it's great being able to provide information to owners uh, to help them, you know, better run their their school or their business or whatever it is. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the, uh, the statistics that I saw um, that it continues to stun me, there was a study done, I think it was by Emerson, that looked at value leakage, uh, you know, sort of during this uh, design and build out phase. And they said, it, you know, about 30% on average of the, the project value is sort of lost by the time you get to uh, occupancy. And a lot of times it's because you didn't really take advantage of those warranty provisions, right? Either they weren't tracked, they weren't entered, or they just, nobody knew enough to take advantage of it uh, when they should have to address some of these issues, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's just, you know, at the end of the day, um, yeah, either you live with it or it gets to a point where now the owner is on the hook and they've got to find the, the funds to do some repairs. Mm -hmm. uh, and either way, I mean, it, it shortens the lifespan of the building itself. So, yeah. yeah, well, let me let me pivot to, to something we've been talking sort of, you know, micro project by project here, but uh, I want to ask you about the book, uh, because this is not micro, this is a big topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so reframing America's 
infrastructure, a ruins to Renaissance playbook. Uh, that's, uh, I can't imagine sort of a, a bigger scope than that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I know it's, it's doing great. It's uh, like at the top of what, four Amazon categories already. That's uh, right. Which is fantastic. Um, but tell us a little bit about it. What's the premise? Well, I mean, thanks for asking. So the premise is, is that infrastructure uh, helps to define the success uh, of a nation and of a civilization. And that uh, America's infrastructure uh, is in need of uh, a renewal. So the book really is divided into three parts. One talks about the history of infrastructure uh, from ancient China to the Romans, um, you know, to the Sumerians. And it talks about all the advances made in infrastructure uh, over, the, over the, the hundreds of years of history. The second part details uh, different problems with different areas of infrastructure uh, ports, highways, uh, and there's, um, I think one reviewer called it an unnerving number of examples uh, with references of problems with current infrastructure. And then the third part sets out some of the visionaries that are leading us uh, into a, uh, you know, time of infrastructure prosperity um, all over the world. Uh, but their focus is in the United States, and it talks about public-private partnerships uh, and uh, compares a lot of what we've done to China. Um, I just met with an architect last night on a matter, and he he was talking about the fact that he never knew what China's approach to building infrastructure was, uh, and that he learned about it in the book. I myself didn't know it until I be began researching. Uh, and so the third part talks about some solutions. It names some visionaries, and um, it's it's been pretty cool the reception that it's received. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm told. Uh, I'm told, I just got word this morning that there's a chance that I'll be passing the book out to the members of uh, the uh, Infrastructure Committee uh, at the United States Congress wow. in a month or two. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's really amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to ask you, I mean, it, there seems to be, uh, obviously, it's, it's been a hot topic for a while. It became one of the signature issues of President Biden's administration. Uh, and it seemed like there was this bipartisan support overwhelming for it. it's one of those topics, those few topics these days where everybody in theory says we support it. And then it sort of fell apart. And in part, I think it was almost this debate about what what constitutes infrastructure even these days. Right. Right. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of examples of things that aren't traditionally thought of as infrastructure, uh, which in a way are. And then, of course, there was some way out there examples that are not. But, you know, it's it's really all about perspective. Um, you know, in the talks that I've given, uh, I try to give the audience a bit of perspective on infrastructure and why it's so important. You know, uh, one of the examples I often cite is the uh, Transcontinental Rail Railroad uh, in the mid 1800s here in the U.S. Uh, that was one of the first big national infrastructure projects that changed the way Americans did business. It changed how we communicated along with the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, that was built, there was a telegraph line from east to west built. And the whole project was financed by the government to two private companies who then in turn pay back with interest the entire loan. And so the Transcontinental Railroad is often thought of as one of the first big infrastructure projects here in the U.S. Um, another great example that I like to use is our uh, interstate highway system um, that is the basis for so much of our collective prosperity. Uh, that was really finished out just after World War II, um, and that with the current infrastructure uh, bill is going to be built out even more. But the ability for Americans to move around, to truck things from A to Z, um, from place to place, uh, people don't really understand what a huge benefit that's been for the entire nation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more to come. Um, even cyber infrastructure is getting some money from the latest uh, infrastructure bill uh, and a lot of broadband so that places that uh, high speed internet has not existed uh, will be a lot more accessible to a lot more Americans at low or no cost. Yeah, it, you know, it seems like those those two examples that you cited, the uh, Transcontinental Railroad and the uh, the interstate system, you know, both of those were so paradigm shifting at the time. Uh, and so I, I sort of wonder, yeah, what is the next paradigm shift in infrastructure? And do you think well, it is that cyber infrastructure? 
Well, uh, I'll tell you collectively, it's it's the investment in all the infrastructure. You know, things that exist are going to be upgraded. Um, there's going to be more money for ports. You know, we've heard about the supply chain issues and efficiency of some of the ports, most notably on the east and west coast. Um, uh, infrastructure money for uh, even local projects. You know, a big part of it is being just given to different counties, uh, mostly large metropolitan counties, and they can spend it how they want. They get to decide locally how they spend it. I mean, what a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, for example, in Bear County or Dallas County, the people who, uh, the elected folks and the experts in the area get to pick what they want to spend it on and how they want their locality to benefit from it. I think that's the, one of the wonderful features uh, of this infrastructure bill is that there's a ton of local control on how and where money is spent. But back to your question, I suppose, I don't know that there's going to be a separate system that takes us to the next level, so to speak. Um, but I think everything in the aggregate is really going to, uh, it's, it's going to change the face of America. Uh, much more, many more people that never had access to large parts of the infrastructure, uh, you know, disadvantaged minorities, uh, economically disadvantaged parts of the, of the U.S. are now going to have access to the things that a lot of the other Americans have not had access to. Uh, and so it's uh, my hope is that it brings us all together in a big way for many different reasons over the many different components. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. And, you know, there's precedent for that. Sears Roebuck got started because of the Transcontinental Railroad. They could ship, uh, you know, to all those farmers who were building the settlements uh, next to the telegraph stations. <laughs> that's right. Thank you for the reference. You know, it's it's history. Uh, history always helps. Uh, and, you know, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat the failures, I suppose. Yeah, that, that's what they say. So, well, so if uh, any of our viewers or listeners want to purchase this book, um, how can they do it? Uh, you can just go to Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. Uh, it's on Amazon, it's for sale on Amazon. Uh, you can also order it at markgravely.com, M-A-R-C, just like you, markgravely.com. So, and it's Reframing America's Infrastructure, a Ruins to Renaissance Playbook. That's right. Yeah. Already in the second printing, by the way. Wow. Wow. And when did it come out? January of this year. January okay. 1. And so here we are, not quite at the end of, uh, of March, and you're already in a second print. That is fantastic. And, you know, um, clearly you, you've hit on something important here. I mean, fascinating just to, to hear you talk about it. I can't wait to read it myself. Um, because, uh, you know, it just seems like it's so topical. And, uh, you know, Anybody who, uh, you know, is, is out there in any way now is impacted by it, right? I think you're right. The, the, it just touches all of us. So, um, so yeah, so uh, definitely encourage people, go check it out. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll uh, hopefully see it in some legislators' hands, uh, maybe in the, uh, the next few weeks or a couple of months, uh, as uh, they get informed about these issues. So Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Hey, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate uh, the, the views, the expertise. Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, there's so much more we could have talked about, but uh, just some, some gold here. So, um, you know, we appreciate you and everything that you're doing on behalf of owners. Uh, and so thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Hope to talk to you again soon. So absolutely. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.